Okay. Welcome everyone to our platform, AR Network, Al-Kibulan Reclaimed Network. With me today is Dr. Ronoko Rashidi. And I just want to welcome you, Dr. Rashidi. Welcome. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Yes. I did visit St. Martin a few years ago. <laughs> and so uh, this is the next best thing to coming back. I do want to come back and visit. I wanted to do this show because it shows that we do, we are looking at things from a global perspective. Yes. That our struggle is not just a local struggle, but it's an international struggle to destroy the remnants of white supremacy and white domination. Yes, yes. Thank you so much. And I am originally from Jamaica, serving here in St. Martin. It's an honor to have you on uh, this platform today. Uh, could you give us a little background of yourself? Well, I live in Los Angeles. I'm an African-American historian, but my focus is of a global nature. You know, um, I try to put a lot of emphasis on the history of African people before the transatlantic slave trade. I'm of the belief that if you think your history began with slavery, the most you will hope to be is a good slave. Or as one uh, professor put it, John Henry Clark, if you think your history began with slavery, everything else in your, in your mind will be progress. But we wanna change that narrative. And it's unfortunate that most sisters and brothers don't know about our glorious history before enslavement. And what is even more frightening, a lot of them don't care. So I've been able to travel around the world. I've visited 125 countries now. I've lectured in 67 countries. I've written or edited 22 books. And now my day is complete. My life is complete because I'm being interviewed by the most beautiful woman in the Caribbean about the history of African people. So I'm delighted. Our topic today is reclaiming our identity as Africans. And so my first question to you is, who are we? Who are we really? Well, we are in fact African people. But in, in addition to that, I think that's very important to emphasize. We are the first people. Humanity began in Africa and spread from there. So we are African people. The problem is, I think that we've been taught that Africa is the worst place it ever was. And so many of us would rather identify as anything other than an African. That's the way it is in the United States. And I would imagine that in the Caribbean, we have similar kinds of issues. We've been taught to be ashamed of who we are. And um, I think the African proverb goes, if you know the beginning well, the ending will not trouble you. The problem is we're not starting at the beginning, we're starting way down the road. And so there's a sense of confusion about who we are. Now, how can we change that? Knowledge yourself. Mm -hmm. I think we, one thing black folk agree upon, if we don't agree on anything else, black people need to unite. Black people need to come together. We all, I think, agree on that. But what is the basis of that unity, what would make us want to come together? And that is, I think, a newfound sense of pride in who we are. And I think that that is able to bridge all the gaps, light skin, dark skin, Christian, Muslim, Buddhist, Jew, Hindu, Ifa, Rasta, Yoda, <laughs> uh, male, female. We all, I think, want to feel like we come from something bigger than ourselves. And so knowledge of self, I'm reluctant to use the word history, but knowledge of self, I think, is the answer because we all want to feel proud and we want to feel like we come from something bigger than ourselves. It gives us an ability to uh, lift our heads a little higher and give us the kind of self-esteem that I think that we need to accomplish great things. Thank you so much. Thank you. When and where have our identity sort of shifted? Slavery and, colon and colonization. Muda Baruka, your brother from Jamaica, likes to say, slavery is not African history. Slavery interrupted African history. 
And one of the worst things about enslavement, in fact, that's a term I think a lot of us would prefer to use these days, as opposed to slavery, enslavement, is that it made a lot of us forget that we had a history before enslavement. And the United States, the big thing is 1619, that Africans were landed at, on, um, in Jamestown, Virginia in the year 1619. We have a big new museum in Washington, D.C., the African American Museum. But if you didn't know better, you would think it was a slavery and civil rights museum. And I am offended when we begin with that. So slavery did us incalculable, I mean, enormous damage psychologically. And we're still battling that, whether we realize it or not. The enslavement thing is there, it's right there in our psyches. So, so how do we reclaim our identity? How can we go back to who we really were? Well, there's a concept called Sankofa, which I'm sure you're familiar with, which basically means to reach back and fetch it. Yes. That's the things that made us great. I think that what the, the key thing for me is to instill a desire to want to know. It's one thing not to know but it's another thing not to be interested. And I think that we all have to develop different strategies and tactics. Now I'm a historian and I travel all over the world to black communities, museums, et cetera, to gather up what I consider many of the missing pieces of African history, which is really the missing pieces of world history. And you're doing it your way. You know, you're doing it by trying to reach out. You're doing it through your ministry, I'm sure. And just the way you carry yourself. Now, in fact, when I called you beautiful, I hope I didn't embarrass you because obviously you are brilliant and you are also cognizant of what you do. You have your beautiful natural hair and you have your jewelry and you have your African clothes and obviously you're proud of who and what you are. And so you are a walking role model. And it tells us that no matter what we have been through as a people, there is still the possibility to reach back and uh, build upon our ancient history and culture and use that as a, a foundation for what we need to do. A colleague of mine puts it like this. He says, what you do for yourself depends on what you think of yourself. And what you think of yourself depends on what you know of yourself. And what you know of yourself depends on what you have been told. So if you are told 24 seven that you come from nothing, that your history began with a plantation or a hacienda or begin in a cotton patch or a remote African jungle, you're gonna ingest that. And yeah. you're gonna have yeah. a negative view, not only of yourself, but the people in your community. So the N word won't be no big thing. And the B mm -hmm. word will roll easily off your tongue. And you might even shoot your sister and brother because you don't see them as having value. So we have to find creative and ingenious ways to give this information to our people. And there are examples of how it works. For example, Malcolm X. Malcolm X, we call our, a lot of us call our black shining prince. But at one point in time in his life, even though Malcolm's parents were Garveyites, also from Jamaica, Garvey is from Jamaica, we know the great Marcus Garvey. Malcolm went astray and became nothing more than a common criminal. And he was incarcerated, unfortunately, but the blessing was that he came under the influence of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and some of the great African historians like uh, Jay Rogers, also from Jamaica, born in Nick Grill. Jay Rogers. And, and he was transformed. And this shows exactly how knowledge of self can impact. And what I really am, this is a big deal to me. I think that we really need to focus on the youth in large measure, because that's the future. Yes. I'm 66 years of age. My generation has done mostly what they're going to do. But it's the grandchildren, the babies who have not been miseducated. Those are the ones that I have the most hope for. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know this next question will be a, a very broad uh, question, really. Uh, what is happening to us presently on a global scale as a people? Well, I would say two things in, measure, in large measure. One is just ignorance. Okay? Okay. 
and the other is lack of organization. You know, organization decides everything. And it's not enough just to be angry and to be outraged. That energy, that outrage, that anger has to be channeled. And I, we're not doing a very effective job with that. In Africa, I think that one of the problems, and I hate to say this, is that you have repressive governments that prevent mm -hmm. organization, that prevent people from gathering, that will not foster uh, a strong sense of knowledge of self. Africans in, um, in the United States, on the other hand, we're just confused and we're not organized and we tend to lack a vision. I emphasize Africans in the United States for one thing, because I'm one, but also because I think that African-Americans have more wealth than most other Africans. And we have something that we tend to, I think a lot of times take for granted. We have a, a level as, as messed up as the United States is. We have a level of freedom of speech that very few groups of Africans actually have. So we have to galvanize our people and show them that what we do and don't do can and will make a difference. And we're, in many ways, we're failing our ancestors right now, as well as future generations. Yes. Thank you, thank you. I, I heard you in a speech lately and you made a remark with a, with a sentence that I found so profound. And I'll ask you this question based on that. How can we be a powerful people again? Well, really we've already answered that question. Organization, <laughs> yes. vision, and knowledge of self. One of the greatest leaders in the history of Africa, certainly in modern times, is a man named Kwame Nkrumah. Kwame Nkrumah was the head of state of Ghana, and he in many ways led Ghana to independence. Yes. He used to say, thought without practice is empty, okay. and action without thought is blind. In other words, we must be thinkers and doers. Yes. People yes. like me, historians, we put a lot of emphasis on ancient Egypt and Nile Valley civilization. That's great. But that was thousands of years ago. We don't live in ancient Egypt today, and we don't have a need to build a pyramid, but we can use the inspiration that comes from that to do the great things that we must do today. And our sisters and brothers must reach out. What you're doing is wonderful. Thank Yesterday, you. I did an interview with a brother from Mexico, an African Mexican. And now today with a sister in St. Martin, who is from Jamaica, talking to a brother in the United States. In a sense, we are miracles. Yeah. We are the yeah. descendants of people who were taken out of the door of no return. And so for us to be together today, to have this conversation, it's miraculous because a lesser group of people would have perished by now. And that's the one thing I think more than anything else that keeps me going. I get very frustrated sometimes. I really wonder sometimes that we are defeated as a people when I look at our behavior. And then I think of what we have gone through, the, the capture of our people like animals, the rape of our women, the middle passage, you know, breeding farms, all of these things, lynchings. And yet somehow we survived all of that. And we are here this morning, this afternoon to have this conversation. I would say that we are miracles. And that motivates me and that keeps me going, even in my moments of deepest, darkest despair, which we all have. Yes, yes. Wow. Uh, I realize that you have a number of images, a lot of pictures that you have taken over the years. Uh, could you tell us about that and uh, their meanings? And why do you do uh, take those pictures? Well, if I had really thought about it clearly, I would have had some of the photographs to share with you right now. Um, I have maybe 500 to 700,000 original photographs yes. from museums, from tombs, from temples, from monuments for around the world. And I think that they're important with the maxim that seeing is believing and a picture is worth a thousand words. I'm not a bad speaker. I give pretty good speeches, but believe me, when a person is actually able to see the images for themselves, that's something very, very different. And we need to be able to see what we've done. And we can get 
completely frustrated and give up when we don't have immediate results. One of the, I've been in the movement for a long time and there are certain mm -hmm. things that you learn. And one of the things that you learn is no matter how hard you work, you can't do it by yourself. We need each other, you know, and we're all we've, we're all we've got basically. So we have to be able to submerge our egos and work with people sometimes that we don't even like. Okay, we say we're at war, and so we have to be able to see the big picture. Another lesson that I learned is no matter how hard you work, we're not going to change things overnight. We didn't get in this situation yesterday, and we're not going to resolve them tomorrow. And so we have to prepare ourselves for generations of struggle. And sometimes I think we give uh, way to frustration and impatience, and we give up and throw up our hands, and then we become part of the problem. You can take a time out. You can take a rest. You can go on holiday. You can even have a vacation, but you can't quit. You can't give up because once you do that, you become part of the problem that we're fighting against. Yes. Do you think many of us in the African diaspora are suffering from uh, identity, uh, so, a sort of an inferior inferiority complex? Oh, no doubt about that. And I think perhaps even beyond that, as I'm speaking generally now, I think we have, a, as a people, a messiah complex. And that is we're expecting somebody to save us, to do for us, to liberate us. Now, I have a really big Facebook following, you know, a lot. I monitor a lot of Facebook pages, et cetera, et cetera. And people, for example, I have one that just focuses on, on history. And we get new people every day. And I send them a welcome letter. And they all say how grateful they are and how much they want to learn and how enthusiastic they are. But almost never does anybody say, how can I help? What can I do? What do you need? How can I? It's like we expect someone to do all the work. And I think that until we are prepared to look in the mirror and ask ourselves, what is my responsibility? Not yours, not what you are gonna do for me, but what can I do right now today to advance the cause of my people? Nobody will take us seriously in the world. And that, is the big question. How do we, and you raised it from the beginning, how do we move our people from being outraged and angry and depressed and sad to actually doing something and believing that doing something will make a difference and that nobody is gonna do it for us. And that is the key. And I wish that I could ask the elder scholars that I grew up around you know, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? And then I realized I'm an elder now and that the responsibility is with me to come up and us to come up with these solutions. There's no magic bullet. It's easy to have a plan. And here's what I say. People say, Renoko, what should we do? One thing, and this may make you mad, it may make you stop the Zoom interview. <laughs> I think black men need to be with black women. I think that's a big deal. I think we need to join organizations of like-minded people. We need to be happy to spend money with each other. We need to put a more, a greater emphasis on educating our children. Okay. We, need, we need to take down images of God that don't look like us. So people would say, Renoko, I used to like you, but now you're telling me I need to be with a black woman and I need to spend money with other black people? And I'm tired, but you're telling me I need to join an organization and I need to work with this person that I don't like? See, that means we're not really serious at this point about it. Liberation for us cannot be a thing where it's convenient or when we have time or when we feel like it or when it's not hot or when it's not cold and when it's not raining and when it's not snowing. I know it never snows in the Caribbean, but I'm <laughs> that these issues we have in other words we have to make black liberation a priority yeah and not a matter of convenience and i wish i had an answer for how we do that so i just keep trying sister i keep trying to put information out there i you know do the best i can and i try to sleep good at night but it's frustrating sometimes when you don't feel like the work you're doing is having the impact that you think it should have yes yes uh, could you just give us some 
final words and how we can move well, forward really? Well, first of all, I want to encourage people to reach out to me, to contact me. Yes. Uh, my email address is renoko at hotmail.com, R-U-N-O-K-O -O at hotmail.com. You can go to my website, which is drrenoko.com, D-R-R-U-N-O-K-O.com. And just to say uh, to the sisters and brothers who are listening wherever they are, or who are watching wherever they are, that this is one struggle. Marcus Garvey said, one God, one aim, one destiny. destiny yeah. and the thing I love about Garvey more than anything else, or there's so many things about him, Garvey comes to us before radio, before TV, before Facebook, and his message was of universal solidarity for African people. Garvey never set foot on the soil of Africa, but nobody loved Africa more. Once he was asked, Mr. Garvey, how did you come to form the organization, the UNIA and ACL, he said, I looked around for the black man's army, his navy, his men of big affairs, and I could not find them. So I decided to help create them. And that's the way we must be today. If we do not see the vehicles for African liberation that we want, we must build them. And it's nobody's responsibility to do that but us. Yes. That yes. we are the ones we've been waiting for. And we need each other. Even the times when we don't like each other and we fall out, we, we, we're all we've got. So I just want to encourage sisters and brothers to keep on keeping on. I want you to invite me back. Yes. And the time I come back, I want to show some photographs. Thank you so much. I thank you so much, Dr. Rashidi. I really honor you for the work that you are doing and for taking the time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. I trust that our listeners and viewers uh, are able to benefit from what you have shared with us and continue to do the, the great work that you are doing. Thank you, my sister. And you continue to do the same. Bless you. One love, one love. One love. <laughs>